Welcome back to Alberta Prime Time. Tonight's Focal Point, your likely abysmal access to justice in civil or family court. More Albertans being tried and convicted by social media and an RCMP boot camp for teens. Our Wednesday crime panel is in. Mark Charrington is a youth justice advocate. Rod Gregory is an Edmonton-based defense lawyer. And Jason Van Rassel is justice and social issues reporter for the Calgary Herald. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, evening Jennifer. Many Albertans, Hi, Jennifer. hello there. Many Albertans know it firsthand. The Canadian Bar Association says our access to justice in civil and family court is, quote, abysmal and profoundly unequal for poor Canadians. Self-representation is on the rise with dire personal consequences that also unnecessarily strain our courts. At their annual conference this week, lawyers suggested several quick fixes, more federal funding for legal aid, full coverage of legal services for those below the poverty line, and to help low-income earners, student legal clinics at all Canadian law schools. Mark, first off, what do young Albertans tell you about the inability to secure legal help because of cost? How does it affect their lives? Well, it's, it's fairly traumatic. I deal with a particularly... Um single young mums uh, who are just entrenched in poverty. Um, they, they're sort of the working poor. They don't qualify for legal aid, but they can't afford sort of the going rates with, with lawyers. What so would the going rates be? Uh, well, Rod, hourly rate, Rod? Rod? Um, the going rates can be anywhere from 250 to 450 dollars an hour. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So a, a young single yeah, just, mom earning minimum and, wage is and, not going to afford. And it that. puts them in a very precarious situation where I've d what dealt with you know young moms turning to prostitution, exploiting themselves just to pay legal fees, you know, <clears throat> and it's something that uh, I was I had an incident um, last week where a young mom tried to defend herself. And, you know, she literally had to hand over her two-year or four-year-old child to me in a jail. And, oh. you know, it's just, it, it, it's a system that it's, it, in my opinion, is very broken, is very tragic. And I think that we need to look, I mean, it's an adversarial system, but we need to look at innovation. We need to look at more of an inquisitive system. And we need to have some compassion to these people because th they're the ones that are not only the most likely to be victimized by crime, but also involved in criminal behavior. And, and, and having that support and that access to justice is, is critical. It just seems like, I mean, you broke my heart when you said she handed Well, I had to drive the four-year-old to the grandmothers. That broke my heart. I mean, it's probably one of the hardest things I've done in And then years. what other social problems that we all wind up paying for and trying to heal does that incident create self-representation and a, a negative outcome rod what do you see you've been actually working on this with other lawyers in alberta trying to get government attention and find solutions it's it's really remarkable um, how it fundamentally strikes against democracy and our freedoms in society it's not just the poor but even middle class have difficulty with access to justice and so I, I put the blame right at the feet of the premier she was justice minister when all of the cuts started uh, someone on aish is not eligible for legal aid because they make too much money so how can and, uh, to be honest two four hundred dollars an hour i don't think that i could afford that no and so what we're looking at it it's not just in criminal law but We've got to set up a support for family law and civil law. Public defenders make less than prosecutors. They're both in the same courtroom. Why does a public defender make less than a prosecutor? They're both working on the same case. Um, why are there cuts to legal aid? And why are there cuts to the diversion programs, mental health diversion, alternative measures, restorative justice, when we have those programs, we don't need to bring in lawyers because the the cases are solved outside of the court system. I don't think Albertans, uh, I mean, we talk about accessibility money-wise, and then there's also the intimidation, but I don't think that Albertans realize, you just had a laundry list there. I don't think Albertans realize all those things have been cut. It, and it's just the tip of the iceberg. Legal Aid has tried to set up family law clinics in rural areas too, 
And the access to justice outside of the big centres is absolutely abysmal. And Jason, why do you think this hasn't been addressed? I mean, we're not always talking about people who've been charged with a criminal offence. We're talking about people trying to solve family matters, trying to solve civil matters. Life happens. And so why, why hasn't anything been done? Well, you're exactly right. The criminal, the criminal part of our justice system tends to be what, what dominates people's consciousness and, and people's attentions. But really, uh, the contact that, that everyday people have with what we generally call a justice system usually comes in other ways, and that can be in family court and in civil court. Um, you know, uh, Rod just touched on it. I mean, there are myriad problems there. People don't understand the system. They don't know where to seek help. When they do find help, there's a pretty good chance that they can't afford it. And while our, our provincial government and justice officials have done a lot in, in the last little while, we've talked about some of this on the, on, on the show, have done a lot to kind of improve uh, how the criminal justice system works, it, it just doesn't seem like the civil and the family law systems are getting that same kind of attention. Um, you know, there have been some tweaks to the system, but what the Canadian Bar Association is talking about are real fundamental changes to all kinds of things, not just what governments do, but also what law schools do, what legal professionals do. They're talking about sweeping change with all the actors and all the moving parts in the legal system to try and improve this situation. I just want to point out the one shining light that I see access to justice, a great improvement is access to women in, who are victims of violence obtaining emergency protection orders. They've really made that a very streamlined, um, compassionate system where women can attend court daily and they're already teamed up with a lawyer. They go right in front of a judge and, 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 and it's been very successful. And, we had some uh, people involved who's, who lost loved ones to drunk drivers. I, I think even you know those types of people could really benefit from legal aid. We had a lady standing in the hallway outside the studio whose son was killed asking the lawyer on our panel questions that she'd gone two years without anybody giving her the answer to. They're just myriad instances. Rod, do you have any hope that our new Minister of Justice, Jonathan Dennis, will listen, especially with the Canadian Bar Association's recommendations this week? Well, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada has echoed what the Canadian Bar Association has said, and it really seems to fall on deaf ears. And what ordinary citizens don't realize is it really strikes at our freedoms and our democracy, and it's something we have to give priority to. Next up, when social media tries and convicts Albertans before they even get to court and an RCMP boot camp for teens, what it's trying to accomplish. Welcome back to Alberta Primetime. This week, the lawyer for one of the men facing child porn charges in the infamous Retea Parsons rape, bullying, suicide case says that internet chats about his client's innocent or guilt could prejudice a trial. In Alberta, angry online chatter about two teens charged with murdering a man and woman when they, the teens escaped a Strathcona County group home painted the 14-year-olds guilty before they were eventually acquitted in court. Now, Mark, we've seen this before. How dangerous is it when it comes to young people in Alberta's justice system? The well, social media well, gets well, vicious. Looking at it from the young person's perspective, it's devastating. Um, they aren't even really interested in, in the outcome, whether they're innocent or guilty. And it's not it, always newspaper cases. No, no. It's kids in, in life. Yes, yes. And, and it, it's, it's just general things of high school bullying. But um, you go to court and all of a sudden everyone's talking about it in and your And everybody in your peer media. circle's aware of it and it's flashed all through the, their social media. So actually the, the court aspect from the young person's perspective in, in, my, in my observations have been in, irrelevant. It's, it's how they're affected internally through all this Facebooking and all this tweeting and, and, and all this so blogs even. And, and it just affects them in so many levels. And you know, it, it's, an, it's an anomaly that, that I don't think we've been able to really Because overcome. Jason, that's the, the hard side of it that Mark's talking about. But Jason, the courts typically are able to ignore the social media rampages. 
I would say so. I mean, what Mark is talking about certainly isn't insignificant when you've been convicted in the, in the court of public opinion. Um, but, you know, if, through years of watching trials where there has been a significant amount of buzz outside the courtroom, whether it's on the Internet or, or just people talking or, you know, occasionally as reporters you get people calling you up sort of, you know, whispering slanderous rumors in your ears and telling you to go investigate it. And you find out it was just totally false and totally malicious. Those things have always happened. Now, uh, we can't discount the, um, the effects that these have on people's reputations outside the courtroom. But I think luckily speaking, and this may be only relatively speaking, there is some solace in that the courts do tend to disregard this. I've watched trials where juries are pretty good at sticking to what's just been presented in the courtroom and rendering their verdict accordingly. And, and you know, it certainly not, doesn't excuse all the filth out there, but yeah. at least uh, in some ways it seems the system's immune to it and Ed work. Edmonton East MP Peter Goldring was called a drunk driver online before he was acquitted by a judge for uh, on a charge of refusing to take a breathalyzer. Uh, Rod, he's been invited back into the Tory caucus now. His life has gone on, but how does he repair his reputation with the public? Well, it can never be repaired, I don't think, to where it was prior to his arrest. Um, I agree with Jason, though. Juries take their roles very seriously, and I don't like to emulate the U.S. justice system, but one thing that they have that is excellent is the jury voir dire where they can question jurors before the trial starts and ask them whether or not they can be impartial. I had a jury this year where a prospective juror went up to the judge before the trial when we were selecting the jury. She said, I cannot be impartial. Well, I was very happy that she came forward and was forthright and uh, so she was excused. So those safeguards can keep a trial fair. But we don't have them here? Our, our ability to question jurors prior to them being selected mm -hmm. is very, very narrow. Interesting. Quickly tonight, finally, before we go, the RCMP has just wrapped up its third annual summer youth camp at the Regina Depot. 32 Western teens, 12 from Alberta, will hopefully inspire even more to apply to the service. 2008 budget cuts trimmed new Mounties to 300 new officers a year, but now the RCMP will try to recruit 1,000 annually for the next three years. They say programs like this help them compete with 50 other forces across Canada vying for recruits. Jason, the Mounties will have a lot of competition, and at a time when their reputation, their reputation is honestly taking a beating. I think it certainly has, and in, in, you look at places like Alberta, but the RCMP is also an iconic police force, and, and I think is still one that can be attractive to young people looking for a career in policing. The other thing you have to remember is that it's smart in any kind of business to do that kind of outreach work, to connect your, your entity, whether it's a police force or a company, with people who might be interested in working for you and see whether it's a good fit. So uh, if they do have some work cut out for them, they're, they're doing a good job by trying to, to reach out to some people and, and maybe dispel or, or get past some of these reputational challenges they've had in the last little while. And Jason, you know the stats were doing much better uh, on you know, the gray wave, as they call it, in policing. There was a real concern probably about 10 years ago that about an aging cohort in policing. And, and right now, it, it's a pretty good balance. If you, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, policing, the average age now uh, tend to be men and women in their 30s. And if you, if you had a bar graph, if you look at it, it's almost, and you drew a line over it, it's almost like a perfect semicircle. So there's a small bar for, for people just entering policing in their 20s, and then it arcs and, and peaks at people in their 30s. And then it goes down almost in an, an exact mirror image uh, down to officers finishing their careers that as they get better. into their late 50s and turn yeah. 60. So yeah, it, it is getting better. Uh, Rod, I'd love to ask you if there's a boot camp for lawyers, but that's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your time tonight. Mark Jarrington is a youth justice advocate, Rod Gregory, an Edmonton-based defense lawyer, and Jason Van Rassel is the justice and social issues reporter for the Calgary Herald. Thank you, gentlemen.